Welcome, I'm Mary Pohl, your host for the Sales Mastery Summit. Do you have a personal plan for high performance? Today's expert works with countless of sales teams on how to take just two hours to design a plan that has them working smarter toward their sales goals. With me today is Ken Thorson, author of Leading High Performance Sales Teams. Welcome, Ken. Thank you. It's going to be a fun 30 or 45 minutes. Well, I'm looking forward to it myself. Well, I appreciate the fact that you are really dedicated to helping sales reps become high performers. And so wanted to start out with um, talking about how you discovered that you really have found a way that helps them become better at what they're doing. Well, a long time ago, I was the vice president of sales running a national sales organization through independent resellers. And uh, as the vice president of sales, I was interested in driving revenue and productivity and trying to find out really what made certain organizations succeed and what made some organizations not successful. And in that study, I found out really that where I had high-performing sales managers, I had high-performing organizations. Uh, and so what I found is I started looking at some of that in my own sales management expertise is that sales managers who are maybe more prescriptive in nature, a little bit more organized in nature, tend to drive more revenue, hire better people, and increase productivity. So that's where it all started. I said I had to find ways to help non-productive organizations become more productive in order to grow revenue. And so we came up with the uh, salesperson's personal business plan at that time. And for the last 14 years that I've been consulting with organizations all over the world, we've been using this and rolling it out and implementing it in many organizations. Okay. Well, you have a great template really for helping sales reps design a personal business plan that really keeps them focused on their goals and the very actions they need to take to hit their targets. I just love the simplicity of it and the thoroughness of it. It's very work smarter of you. Well, it, it really evolved because as any good manager will tell you, especially sales leaders, you have to understand your people and you have to be more organized. So uh, part of the plan is personal. So we ask the people, what are their personal objectives? What do they want to accomplish in the next year or six months? Normally, this plan is developed every six months. It spe specifically is rolled out in uh, January at generally at the sales kickoff meeting in January, where the salespeople will stand up in front of their peer group and share their personal and professional business plan. So we ask things like what their personal objectives are, but we also ask them what do they need for sales development? Uh, what do they need in selling skills? What do they need in product or service skills? What do they need in operations or industry awareness? Now that's nice because now the sales manager can coach, counsel, and mentor, but he or she also then has the ability to capture all of the training needs for their entire sales team and build out an ongoing sales training event. So that's the personal side of the plan, but we also ask them a variety of other questions around activity uh, and allowing them to set their own goals for whatever activity levels the sales manager believes they need to focus on. So it becomes their plan and they own it. Okay. So, Ken, in your experience, do um, reps have a good feel for what their development needs or training needs are? Um, do, do you run into blind spots there, or do they have a pretty good judgment on what it is they need to hit their well, goals? Part of, part of the plan is that it forces people to think. It moves the sales organization from being opportunistic to being proactive and almost prescriptive. So the first time you roll it out, I expect the plans not to be glorious. I expect them to be, uh, at least have the people spend a couple of hours thinking about their territory. We ask them to forecast revenue three times their quota, and we ask them to detail it out as, as much as they can specifically, uh, looking at their pipeline and non-pipeline activity. But what we find in sales skills is that most salespeople have a pretty good feel and when you ask them where they need improvement, they can come up with the ideas. But obviously what happens also is that as the salesperson works on their draft, they then marry sit down with their sales manager and work through the plan on a draft basis. Because in the end, they have to sign it, but the sales manager also has to sign it and approve it before they stand up in front of their co-workers, even presidents of the companies and CFOs, and present their plan. Okay. The real good part, the real good part is, is the July event. 
because in June they get to re look at the plan, readjust the plan. And then they have to stand up and say, well, this was my plan in January. This is what I did. And now this is what my readjustments are for this next six months. Okay. Because it's now holding them accountable. I like it. Yeah, you know you've got that six-month meeting coming up. So what is the magic in three times quota? Well, uh, generally, the magic is forcing the salesperson, again, to look at every one of their existing customers, look at their territory if they have territory, or look at the accounts they have or the accounts they want to have, and be able to think about, what haven't I sold with that account? This gets back into what we call cross-selling and upselling. A lot of people don't focus on it. We focus on it in our practice quite a bit. But it really, again, takes a salesperson from finding out what could happen to thinking about what could happen and how they can make it happen. Uh, and the three times quota is knowing that we ask them three questions uh, after we ask them for their forecast. We say, okay, you had to forecast three times quota by product area or by customer, depending upon the type of company. But then we ask them, what is the most likely number? What is the highest achievable number you think you get? And what's the lowest minimum number you think we get? So now we've asked the salesperson to focus three times quota, but then to bring it back into the ballpark okay. and ask you highest, medium, and low. Now, the sales manager also has that number for each of their salespeople, and the sales manager can, can start to accumulate their forecasted revenue. Okay. I would imagine that forcing the three times quota thinking forces a sales rep to think um, I, you can't do business the way you've always done it then because you don't have three times more work hours in the day to accomplish three times quota so what are you going to do drastically differently and that may tie back then to their development objectives it, it could perhaps years. yes very good it could perhaps uh, the real key now is the sales manager has this tool that he or she can sit down with their salespeople once a month and review. So it's not meant to be every six months and let's look at it. It's a coaching tool okay. because now the manager can look at the training and development needs. They can, he, he or she can look at their personal goals, their professional goals, uh, their income goals, if that's part of the program, which it is with some firms and some firms don't put that in, don't include that. Uh, it can also look at another important element we add in the business plan which is what I call the influencer area. We ask them to identify five people that that salesperson will work with that could influence their business and their territory. It could be other salespeople that they network with. It could be consultants within the industry if they're in a vertical kind of market. It could be a whole variety of things that they are focused on building the market. Okay. The real interesting element is at the end, when we ask them for their own marketing plan, uh, they actually have to create a month-by-month marketing plan. So if they're territory based or even if they're non-territory based, what marketing things, events, tools that they're going to use themselves uh, to increase their business and also coordinating with the master marketing plan of the company. So if we're going to be in a trade show in March, for an example, I know that in February I need to be calling all my individuals who will be attending that trade show and trying to set up appointments trying to find out who's attending and really promote utilization at our booth. Okay. So there's a real nice coordination plan from that perspective. Oh, I like that. So the sales rep's marketing plan segues into the company's marketing plan to, as far as the personal activities they do to support the larger marketing? Yes. As, as a lot of people think about sales as having a sales funnel, and that's a pretty well-defined process where we have X number of prospects, and as we work them through the sales process, we come back to a, the bottom of the funnel. Well, we also have to consider a marketing funnel, and the marketing funnel feeds the sales funnel. Uh, part of that responsibility is marketing, and part of that responsibility is sales. So a very prescriptive sales manager uh, has a recipe, adds the ingredients to be able to keep that funnel going. And we know that uh, depending upon the business, as an example, a salesperson may have to generate three new prospects a month. Marketing may need to generate, say, six new prospects a month. Uh, and those nine prospects have to then go into that first stage of that funnel. So we want to make sure the salespeople are thinking about that and, and that they have ongoing pre-planned events. The worst thing that can happen is for a sales manager, let alone a salesperson, to wake up and find out that the funnel is too skinny, 
too far back, and they won't be able to achieve their quota in 60 days because there was not enough management or scientific assessment of what was happening in the funnel. Okay. So, Ken, what um, place does working on your win, win rate ratio or um, the time of, timing of your sales cycle, does that fit into this personal business planning? Uh, yes, because in the uh, personal plan, there are four, uh, one section with usually about four questions. Uh, and it has to deal with what metrics we want to coach and counsel and track by the salesperson. So if we have a win-loss ratio, which means uh, how many proposals did a particular salesperson deliver and how many wins did that salesperson have, they will put a goal. And they'll put a goal that I want to have a 50% win-loss ratio. So if I delivered five proposals, and I, or I developed 10 proposals and I won five, that means that I have a 50% win-loss ratio. So the salesperson will put those goals in there. Again, now the sales manager can coach, counsel, and monitor them, but they're the goals of the salesperson. So one of the things that a lot of people get confused on, Mary, is that when sales managers are either new or inexperienced, they start tracking a variety of numbers, and they start kind of working with the salespeople on those numbers, and the salespeople sometimes think it's micromanagement. Well, in reality, and the way we coach it and work at our firm is that the sales managers need to find out what the recipe is for each of their salespeople. So I need to know what Ken Thorson's win-loss ratio is. I need to know how many presentations a month that Ken Thorson needs to make, not to micromanage, but to understand in order for Ken to exceed his quota, what's his average numbers of presentations, proposals, face-to-face -face activity, whatever they are within the sales leadership position. And I might just step back on one point that is not pertinent to this program, but would be pertinent to all the listeners, is that one of the key metrics we like to suggest that salespeople and certainly sales managers find is a leading indicator. Much like you hear on the news today about leading economic indicators, mm -hmm. there are certain steps in the sale early on that should be measured and tracked because they can be leading indicators that will help the sales manager and the salesperson see that if they're doing those leading indicators effectively, they will know it will naturally lead to a presentation or a demonstration that will certainly lead to a proposal. So knowing those metrics and tracking leading indicators are a very important element too. Do you have some good examples of what a leading indicator may be? Well, it will vary uh, based on industry. For example, I deal with a lot of technology-based organizations, and in that world, generally the salesperson is making the first one or two calls, qualifying them, understanding the issue. And then they generally will bring a pre-sales engineer or a subject matter expert into the call to discuss the technical aspects of the opportunity or of the product to really make sure there's a fit, there's a working relationship back and forth. Well, generally you measure the number of what I call engineering calls or subject matter expert calls because they generally will lead to the next step, which might be a more detailed presentation. It may lead to a product overview demonstration that will lead to the proposal. So I like to track something like that as an example. In engineering companies, that's very important. In some organizations uh, where we have uh, professional services involved, they may have marketing people involved in helping that, but then eventually they'll need to bring that subject matter expert into the call and at that point, uh, I would track that as an event. Okay. So you've taken us through the beginning parts of our, our business planning, which is setting our objectives, what are our development needs to achieve our objectives, what type of um, goals are we setting for hitting quota, um, best case, most likely, minimal, or um, the, the floor threshold. Um, our win rate target that we're after. Um, and now we've talked a bit about, well, we talked about the influencer strategy, which I thought, hmm, that's a good opportunity to leverage LinkedIn, it sounds like. And then you also shared um, how the salesperson's marketing plan fits in with the larger marketing plan for their company. And so what else do we need in this personal business plan? Well, there's three questions we close the plan on, and then I'll talk more about what happens when you execute and use this plan. Uh, the three questions are very interesting because uh, they're interesting not because of the question, but they're interesting to hear the results. 
when you have your salespeople standing up in front of each other, standing up in front of the company president, other management team members, listening to these business plans, the last three questions are individual. Now, let me just read those to you. Um, how I will be more efficient in the next six months. How I will improve my territory in the next six months. How I will contribute to my company's success in the next six months. All very personal questions. Uh, and the answers you get the first time you do this and the second time you do it, all the answers are much more complete and better. It almost becomes a bonding experience because you hear people making a commitment. They're making a personal commitment to work the plan. They're making a personal commitment to improve their territory and to contribute to the company's success. And it's a, it's a great way uh, to be able to implement this. Again, the other thing, the sidelight of this is, as I hear you, Mary, stand up and, and do your, present your plan to me, and I'm one of the five other salespeople, the other 50 salespeople in the room, I might learn something. I might hear, hey, that was pretty clever. I like what Mary did there, or I really appreciate that. Or if I have a small organization, the salespeople understand what each other's doing, you know, what their goals are, what their activity levels are going to be, what their anticipated revenue numbers might be, what their marketing ideas are, and you start learning from each other, but also starting to hold each other accountable. So as you start talking about your business plan, you start thinking about it 30 days later, 45 days later, there's some cross element of education. Uh, and that's really valuable part of it. And that's where one of the themes I I talk a lot about is building what I call a self-managed sales team, which is the goal of every sales manager, uh, because it's not the sales manager's job to make quota. It's the salesperson's job to make quota. The sales manager's job is to hire effectively, train them effectively, and put people in place to win. But having a self-managed sales force with their own self-developed business plan that drives both emotion and logic is critical. Here's the line I like to use. You want to align the soul of the individual with the goal of the corporation. So you want to align the soul of the individual with the goal of the corporation by linking their personal objectives and their personal commitments along with revenue generation numbers. That's a good way to do that because now I can see what my work's going to do, what the payoff could be in commission, and how I'm going to be able to afford that trip to Italy because I'm going to make enough money in commissions to do that. The, the other piece that I like about the sharing is you talked about it besides um, the cross learning that happens as each presents, as you get to the influencer strategy for networking, there's a chance to actually help and support each other on that instead of always feeling at um, a competitive conflict going on or I need to beat you, you can actually work together more as an actual team. Absolutely. And that's why the, you'll see the first time you roll this out, they struggle a little bit. They try to understand how to put plans like this together. Uh, but the second time you do it in the July meeting, it's a different experience. They're, they've already thought through it. They realize that some of their goals and their objectives were maybe not accurate or too optimistic or not opti optimistic enough. They got a feel of how to manage themselves based upon their plan. And now the, the plan gets really good for the second half of the year. When they do it the third time, January of the next year, uh, it's an incredible issue because it's easier, they thought through it, they know what they're doing, uh, you'll see their personal develop development start to expand, uh, and they'll st you'll start to see their forecasting become more accurate uh, because now they've thought through their territory, they understood what they were attempting to do the first time. So I, never, I, I want to hold people accountable for getting it done right the first time, but I always know that the second and third time will be outstanding. Okay. So, Ken, is there somewhere where our viewers can turn if they wanted more help with their own business planning to get going? Well, sure. Um, on our website, acumenmanagement.com, uh, you'll find some free resources. There's a free video on hiring salespeople, on training salespeople. There's a free sales compensation assessment out there, as well as a white paper I wrote on the 40 actions for, predictable, or for building predictable revenue. On the business plan itself, uh, we have something called a sales manager's toolkit where they can go to acumenmanagement.com and go to our store and you can actually order the sales manager's interactive toolkit, which has about 40 Word documents on how to interview, hire, train, as well as the personal business plan for salespeople to use. Uh, all of those are there so they can modify them, you can download them, use them, and improve your organization. 
Okay. And is there anywhere where they can get the business planning template? They can send me an email at, uh, and they can just simply Google me or they can send me an email at Ken at AcumenMGMT.com or just Google Acumen Management Group or Ken Thorson. Okay. Super. Okay. And I, with how many different salespeople that you've worked with over the years, I'm sure you have some favorite stories of how you've really helped people transform their own sales practices by implementing personal business plans. Do you have any stories that pop out as some of your favorite? Well, um, <laughs> that's interesting. I probably can't use any names, but yes, I, I can think of quite a few. After uh, using this for a number of years when I was working as a vice president of sales, and we implemented that throughout our network. But the last 14 years of working with people all over North America and around the world for that matter, uh, we've implemented this in, in several kinds of situations. Uh, I think the large part of what we do is change management. Uh, you know, while we fix companies, you have to fix them by changing culture. I just finished a terrific book. It was an old book, but I just came across it called Who Says Elephants Can't Dance? And it was written by Louis Gerstner, who was the man who turned around IBM. A lot of people don't remember that back in the 90s, IBM was struggling. They were running out of cash. They were losing market share. And they hired a new CEO to come in. And for about 10 years, he ran IBM. And uh, in the book, he makes a really big issue that culture is the number one thing that has to change in those kinds of environments. So a lot of times, we've implemented this, uh, usually the second or third thing we try to do to get the company and get the salespeople and get the sales leadership team on their toes and to bring accountability into the organization, to bring more planning and execution into the organization. And I can think of uh, one company that really kind of fought change. Uh, we changed a couple things and then I said it was about time to start to launch the, the business plans. And they had about 40, 35 salespeople, a couple different branches, a couple different offices. So the first thing we had to do is we really had to sell the field sales managers because without the field sales managers getting on board, generally nothing happens. One of the reasons CRM systems fail a lot is that field sales managers not brought in, not sold, or not buying into the process. So we got them to understand what the benefits of this process would be. They looked at it as more paperwork, uh, more systems in place. But once they understood their job was coaching, not making quota, once they understood their job was development, uh, and uh, managing the business and creating self-managed salespeople, they bought into it. Once they saw uh, what the reps did, uh, we rolled it out. Once they saw what the reps did, they were amazed that the uh, change in the salesperson's attitude of that it was their business, it was their territory, it was their plan, uh, and they started seeing the sales numbers pick up after about 90 days. Because what happens is that in forcing them to forecast three times their quota, they had to really look at the marketplace they were serving. They had to look at the prospective clients they had. And they had to kind of start to identify potential opportunities that weren't even in the pipeline. And all of a sudden, as they started understanding the cross-sell and the upselling concepts, uh, pipelines got bigger. Uh, proposals became larger, actually. Their average order size went up something like 12% uh, after six months. So it was a really nice experience to change culture but it had to be sold all the way down the line. Uh, it starts at the top. Anything happens has to stop with, or start with the president or uh, the vice president of sales. And from there, we have to keep working down. And it's a selling process. The real key, however, with this particular company is getting the sales managers uh, in an ongoing program to make sure that they always carried that business plan with them when they went out to spend a day with a salesperson. Uh, one of the things that we don't see a lot is that sales managers don't make a lot of sales calls with their salespeople. They're there either to sell the company sometimes if they have to make a corporate presentation, or they're there to try to save a deal at the last moment. What they really have to do is go out and watch Ken Thorson make his first call, watch him make his second call on an ongoing basis every month. And when we got them to carry the business plan with them, and while they're driving, open up the business plan and talk about it with the sales reps, all of a sudden, there was a connection between the salesperson and the sales manager talking about the salesperson's success. And all of a sudden, we got a real positive change. So I, I always think of that as a story because it, it really impacted uh, not only the person's life, but it impacted the professionalism of the salespeople. 
So since most of our viewers are the sales professionals themselves, we can encourage them, create your personal business plan, even if it isn't expected of you, and bring it to your manager or you know proactively have that as you're working together um, so that you can be more effective together. Is that fair? Absolutely. I think, you know, I always believe that the reason people are in sales is to control their own destiny, to have a certain amount of independence. And with that independence, it really means that you need to have a professionalism about you that other people don't have sometimes if they're not uh, managing their own quotas, managing their territory, working with customers on an ongoing basis. So build a self-managed mentality about how to raise your success level, how to increase and find out what ingredients you need to be successful. I know in my life I had to do five presentations a month in order to have enough opportunity to build enough proposals to win. Uh, and I can tell you in my own life for the last 14 years of running my own consulting business, same thing is true. Uh, there's a certain number of things that I have to do every day, every week, every month uh, to make sure that my pipeline is full. So I speak to you not only as a sales management consultant, uh, but as a sales professional myself and understanding what's necessary to have the self-discipline and process. Remember, rather than being opportunistic, you need to be proactive and prescriptive. Okay. Now, as your um, clients start embarking on creating their first personal business plans, where do they get stuck? What trips them up? Great question. Um, the biggest area uh, that I've always been surprised at is we ask them in the business plan to identify how many customers they serve, if they're in a customer area or in a territory area. But then we ask them the number of suspects or prospects within their territory. So if they're working a zip code territory or they're working half the state or four states or if they're uh, not in territory but they're working certain kinds of accounts most salespeople don't have a feel for that they really have not thought about analyzing the marketplace thinking about what who is the ideal client and that's the biggest struggle they have next when we go down we ask them for their activity in other words how many demonstrations a month are you going to do how many face-to-face -face calls you're going to make whatever the activity levels are, and they're different for every industry, they really have a struggle trying to estimate how many they're going to do each month. Uh, everybody says, well, I'm going to do as many as I can. Yeah, but what's your goal? Uh, and so those two areas are the areas that most people really struggle at of trying to come up with uh, the business plan, which surprised me, quite frankly, when we first did this. I thought most people would have a feel for that, but I take a very prescriptive approach of how do you really scientifically figure out how to build your business. Okay. Love it. Um, if you had to recommend one thing that our viewers could do right now today to be more successful, what would that one thing be? Absolutely. I would call you, I would say the cross sell and upsell. Uh, no matter what products or services you sell, think about if a customer has product A, what would be the next logic product or service for B and for C? It could be within one vendor product line, but if you have multiple vendors in your product line or service line, think about how multiple vendors, products, and services work together and then sit down. One thing we haven't, and sit down and think about it. One thing we haven't talked about, we also have an account planning process where we actually, if you're an account salesperson, where you sit down and you really think about each of your accounts and you think about what's your strategy for this quarter for this account. And then we ask them to come up with five tactical sales steps of what they're going to do to penetrate that account or to further sell that account or open up that account. In that area, we really sit down and we say, okay, who can I contact? And we like to suggest, and I love pizza, Mary. Um, if you haven't figured out by now, I'm, I'm into food because I like recipes and ingredients and, and those kinds of elements. So think of a pizza. I like to suggest you, you think of all the ingredients in the pizza, and if this particular slice of the pizza is the one you want, Go out and sell that this quarter. In other words, contact every customer you have about that product combination or the upsell or cross-sell. Next quarter, take another product or something and go after it. Or the other idea is take 20 clients a month and focus on 20 clients who have a certain product or service that they're using and figure out what else can I sell them. Increasing the wallet share of your customers is the number one thing we talk about with most entrepreneurs or business owners of, of companies. If we have secured a client, our job is to figure out what else can we provide them to improve, improve our product service levels and increasing our wallet share with that particular company. Okay, that makes sense. 
Well, this has been extremely helpful, Ken. Um, I love, as I said, the simplicity as well as the thoroughness of the business planning template. And so I hope our viewers reach out and start using that template on their own and um, achieve all of the benefits of working smarter with it. Well, thanks. It's always fun to share tips and ideas with people. Uh, being in the business as long as I have and working with people, uh, I really enjoy, I get a kick out of seeing organizations start to accelerate. Uh, so they can find that at acumenmanagement.com. Love it. Thanks. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in and investing in your own success. The Sales Mastery Summit is here to help you never stop learning from the best. Take care.